Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ, Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Alleluia, Christ our Passover has been sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Not with old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Alleluia. Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death, the death that he died, he died, he died to, to sin, sin once, once for all. But the life, the life he lives, he lives to God. God. So also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Jesus Christ our Savior. Alleluia. Christ, Christ has, has been, been raised from the dead, the, dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by Adam came death, by the new Adam has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, die. So, so in Christ, Christ shall all be made alive. Alleluia. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you raised your servant Anselm to teach the church of his day to understand its faith in your eternal being, perfect justice, and saving mercy. Provide your church in every age with devout and learned scholars and teachers that we may be able to give a reason for the hope that is in us. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for our lesson. Our lesson today comes from the Acts of the Apostles. As Peter and John were speaking to the people, the priests and captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the morrow, for it was already evening. But many of those who heard the word believed, and they outnumbered about 5,000. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes were gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had made the prisoners stand in their midst, they inquired, By what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are questioned today because of a good deed done to the morrow who was sick and are asked how this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all of the people of Israel that this man is standing before you in good health by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. By him this man is standing before you well. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, but which has become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be saved. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The psalm today that we are reading is Psalm 116. Psalm 116. And we will be reading verses 1 through 8 in unison. I love the Lord because, because he, he has heard the voice of my supplication, because, because he has inclined his ear to me whenever I call upon him. The cords of death entangled me, the grip of the grave took hold of me. I came to grief and sorrow. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, I pray you, save my life. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. The Lord watches over the innocent. I was brought very low, and he helped me. Turn again to your rest, O oh my soul, for the Lord has treated you well. For you have rescued my life from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I will walk in the presence of the Lord in the land of the living. Let us now stand for the reading of the gospel. Amen. 
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathanael of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, We will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net to the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in, because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon went, Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, a hundred fifty-three of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was how the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Well, tonight is, of course, the feast of uh, St. Anselm of Canterbury, one of the great theologians. Uh, but we're actually going to commemorate another saint who, not really a saint, uh, a, more of a contemporary of our own, but maybe one day he'll be some sort of recognized as some sort of saint. Uh, but somebody I think Anselm would probably appreciate, certainly this person appreciated Anselm, I, I believe. We're going to hear a little bit about William Stringfellow. We've commemorated him before. I don't know if you have ever, do you know who William Stringfellow is? Do you know who William Stringfellow is? I actually do not. One of my theological heroes, a great, great theologian, but someone, you got to say, not very well known anymore. Uh, he was born in 1928, died in 1985. Um, a very interesting person. Uh, yeah, I, I, I preached a little sermon about him during Holy Week at one point, but... Uh, We'll, we'll hear a little bit about William Stringfellow. You can tell me what you think about him afterward. He was a theologian and a social critic. The uh, quote comes from him. I believe biography and history is inherently theological in the sense that it contains already, literally by virtue of the incarnation, the news of the gospel, whether or not anyone discerns that. We are each one of us parable. I love that. We are each one of us parables. That's a beautifully poetic thing to say. On a trip to the United States in the early 1960s, the famous theologian Karl Barth encountered a young lawyer who, whose pointed questions reflected a profound biblical sensitivity to the signs of the times. Afterward, Barth uh, remarked, this is the man America should be listening to. The man in question was William Stringfellow a lawyer by training, a theologian and prophet by calling, who in his many books applied the word of God to the moral issues of his age, such as poverty, war, racism, sexism, the abuse of political and ecclesiastical authority. And we're just gonna pause there. All new issues. Huh? All new issues. All brand new issues. Things we don't deal with at all right now. I mean, those are just purely 1960s things. Um, <laughs> that's, that's so true. Uh, but I think what is interesting is when you look at the, the years of his life, 1928 to 1985, he was smack dab right in the middle of all of that stuff that we're still dealing with the after effects. And I don't know if they're after effects. We're still dealing with the effects of a lot of those things. But um, fascinating in that sense. 
William Stringfellow was born on uh, April 26, 1928, raised in the Episcopal Church. He was negatively goaded toward, uh, toward his vocation by the suggestion of a parish priest that he think about becoming a priest. Repelled by the implications that ordination made one a superior Christian, he immersed himself in the international Christian student movement, attempting to prove that one could be a quote-unquote professional Christian uh, without the certificate of ordination. Now, that sounds like nothing for us. That's kind of the way, you know, a lot of people think, at least in the Episcopal Church now. But back then, that was, what, the 30s or 40s, I'm, we're thinking? 1928, he would have been, what, uh, 28, 30, 48, about 1948, somewhere around there. That was radical thinking. I mean, back then, the priest was the priest. And that was just kind of the way it was. Oh, those good old days. No. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> joking, joking. Uh -huh. uh, anyway. True colors. <laughs> yes, my true colors are showing. No. Uh, actually, I would, I would absolutely hate that, and you know I would. But uh, later he acknowledged the Phariseeism behind the attitude, admitting that for all his activity, I was no Christian as such at the time. Nevertheless, he maintained his conviction that no special vocation divides one class of Christians from another. And as much as I joked before, I believe that 100%. Priests are not higher than lay. A priest is not higher than a deacon. We are all equal just doing our different ministries side by side. That is very much what I believe. And that's what he would somewhat believe, but he still had issues with authority, which is part of the other reason why I really like him. Anyway, really, I know it's hard to believe I have issues with authority. I, who would ever think that? I'm so, I'm so loyal. Um, <clears throat> nevertheless, uh, uh, he, he maintained this special vocation, uh, and uh, a vocation means being a human being. Every decision is a vocational event. Now, we're going to pause there about that word vocation. Um, that word is being bantered about here pretty easily, and uh, Robert Ellsberg doesn't really go into that word, but vocation comes from that word voce. Voce means voice. It's a calling. Our vocation is a calling. And I, te I taught a whole class on this at the University of Mary, the difference between our profession and our vocation. A lot of people don't know the difference. They kind of combine the two. And they think, well, this job that I have for 30 years and I've worked very diligently at, that's my vocation. It's not. It's your job. That's something you do to, to get the money in. You're an accountant. I don't know if that's your vocation, if you were necessarily called to be an accountant. You might have been. That might have been a very valid thing. But most people probably aren't called to be an accountant. You're, when you're 13 years old, you don't go, hey, I really want to be an accountant. You know what you want to be when you're 13 years old, like me? You wanted to be a priest. You wanted to have, because you felt a calling from something higher than you. Now, there are jobs, there are professions in which you have legitimate calling for. Teaching, for example, is a valid vocation. It is, you become a teacher. You're not just teaching and doing teaching. You actually become, it's, it gets bound up in who you are. And that's how I always say uh, that, that, you know, it's a, a legitimate vocation. Even after you retire, you're still what you were called to do. And that's always the way to look at it. Um, a teacher is still a teacher even after they retire. I've got teachers here. You are. You, it's in your system. It, now, not, see, not all teaching has to be a vocation. Some people do it just as a job. But there are people who really truly believe that their teaching is a vocation. My father was, um, you know, he, was, he worked in road construction. Now, you'd think that was just a job for him. It wasn't just a job for him. He was doing that since he was a kid. It was in his bones. And he also was kind of in this mode where he was supposed to retire at a certain age. He still kept on working. And the idea of not doing that anymore killed him. And it really did because literally we were planning that, that um, retirement party the night before he died. And he really was not looking forward to not doing that anymore. So that's, that's kind of my attitude about vocation. And, I, and that's kind of what he's talking about. Vocation here means a calling. It's something very specific. It's who you are to some extent, rather than what you do. After being drafted in the army and uh, serving a term in Germany, Stringfellow attended Harvard Law School. Emerging as 
uh, someone virtually opposite of what Harvard Law School, uh, Har Har Harvard Law School graduate was expected to be, he settled into a vermin-ridden apartment in Harlem to practice uh, poverty law. From this vantage point, he acquired a particular perspective on the world that informed his later writings on the power and principalities of the world. He remained fascinated with the capacity of impersonal institutions, the state, the law, medicine, and the church itself to invest themselves with, a, with some sort of spiritual authority. But while his Harlem experience brought many encounters with the powers of death, it was there that he also encountered the power of grace and the triumph of life. This, as he later wrote, enabled him to survive his battles with illness and death. In the late 1960s, Stringfellow was found to be suffering from a life-threatening uh, metabolic disorder that led to diabetes and a host of attendant ills. With little expectation of long life, Stringfellow retired with a friend, the poet Anthony Town, to a house on Block Island that they named Eschaton. Now again, a lot of things were just breezed over in that little paragraph, as you probably could tell. Uh, first and foremost, the fact that he had a life-threatening illness. That was a big aspect of this. It was a transformative event in his life. Um, you sort of get the impression that he was a headstrong, kind of an arrogant kind of guy. He came from a privileged family, lifelong Episcopalian that he was, went to Harvard Law School, all of those things. Okay, yes, he went and worked in Harlem, but there was still an arrogance to him. This, this illness laid him low. The other thing, of course, that was breezed over was his lifelong friend. Now, this is a Catholic book. They were more than friends. But, uh, I know, it's, but, um, what is interesting is that there is a lot of talk still about what exactly was entailed in that relationship between William Stringfellow and Anthony Town. Anthony Town, by the way, was a great poet. Uh, he published a, a book called The Funeral of the Death of God, which was uh, really a well-received book of poetry for that, the late 1960s anyway. Um, if you Wikipedia William Stringfellow, it will say that they had a platonic relationship. Well, and platonic, at least, certainly in the writings, it comes out that way, his writings. But of course, we have to understand the time in which he was living and the world in which he lived and the audience he was writing for. He was a evangelical Christian in the Episcopal Church. And it was evangelical publishers who were publishing his work. And the most revealing book he wrote was a book he wrote about Anthony Towns' death in 1980. It's a fascinating book. It's one of the best books written on grief that I've ever read. I've read it so many times, the book is falling apart. It's that good. But nothing, you can't catch anything of it about what was the real nature of their relationship. I mean, outside of a deep love that they had for each other. So could this have been a platonic love? It could have been. Uh, that's not outside the realm of possibility, considering the generation that they were, considering the times they lived in. Reality says probably it was more than that and that they couldn't reveal it. But you know what? It doesn't really matter. It's their private life. They loved each other, and it was a very deep and meaningful relationship. So, David. Very much so. Uh, Stringfellow's, uh, certainly Stringfellow's bad health contributed to a tendency to view the world in the light of eternity and a willingness to risk unpopular stands. He came into conflict with his own Episcopal Church for being an early advocate for the ordination of women. We're going to pause there for a second. That wasn't the only reason he came into conflict with the Episcopal Church. Uh, he was a rebel, and he rebelled against everything, and he wanted the church to change. Now, this was back in the 60s, when things were changing in the world, but the Episcopal Church was slow to change on these things. Some people remember, or at least have heard about what the Episcopal Church was like in the 1960s. One of his best friends in the Episcopal Church was Bishop Jim Pike, James Pike, the Bishop of California. One of the most controversial characters in the Episcopal Church. I preach about him on a regular basis. 
I have kind of a love-hate relationship with Jim Pike. I think everybody who knew Jim Pike had a love-hate relationship with him, including his three wives. But that's a whole other ball game. Um, and that probably tells you a lot about who Jim Pike was right there. And the fact that he died in the Judean wilderness. Uh, you know, a fascinating story. Uh, William Stringfellow and Anthony Town wrote two books about William Stringfellow. And the last book, which was a big, thick book called The, the, the Trial of William Stringfellow, was a fascinating book about fractured human beings being saints of God. And again, it's a really great book. It means a lot to me. And there's a phrase in there that I have used so many times in my life, uh, and I've referenced in sermons about how at the end of his life, Stringfellow says, um, Merton had died, or uh, Merton, um, Pike had died to all of those things that he was known for or striving for. He died to fame, he died to the divorces, he died to his addiction to alcohol, he was a recovering alcoholic when he died. He died to the controversies of the church. All of those things died in Christ, so that when he died in the Judean desert, it was like birth. And I loved that phrase so much, it's so meaningful to me. Uh, and it, it really, for me, shows the redemptive quality of fractured saints that we all are fractured saints to some extent, but we're all redeemed in Christ no matter what. We die to all those things that made us fractured and we're redeemed in Christ. That's, that's Stringfellow at his genius best, as far as I'm concerned. So that's, that was him on one thing. Uh, he was also an outspoken, very outspoken, and early critic of the war in Vietnam. One of his closest friends was the Jesuit priest Daniel Berrigan. And he, this is probably what he became most famous for. Uh, of course, Berrigan was convicted along with eight others for destroying draft files in an anti-war protest. This was in about 1969, 1970. When Berrigan failed to surrender to authorities to begin his prison term, he became a fugitive, infuriating the FBI by popping up in churches and rallies across the country. In the end, tipped off by an informer, 100 FBI agents descended on Stringfellow's house, Stringfellow and Town's house, on Block Island, off the coast of... Delaware, Maryland, something like that, um, where they found their quarry. Stringfellow and Town were themselves arrested and charged for harboring a fugitive. The charges were ultimately dismissed. Another great book that Stringfellow wrote was a book all about the Berrigan Affair, and it's called The Berrigan Affair. It is a, it's a just, if you're a rebel in the church, you got to read that book sometime. It is really incredible. Um, it is less about Stringfellow and Town and a lot about Philip Berrigan, who really was a, one, of, one of my big heroes. I love Philip Berrigan so was much. It Daniel or Philip? Uh, Daniel. Daniel had a, he had a brother, Philip. Yeah. Oh, okay. There were the Berrigan brothers. His brother, Philip, was a priest, but left the priesthood eventually. Daniel is the guy. D Daniel was the Jesuit. I love the Jesuit. Uh, and I always confuse them. So. In the book that, uh, the books that followed, Stringfellow uh, continued to define what he called an American moral theology, seeking to relate the American experience of society and nationhood to the biblical saga and uh, social witness. It was, he observed, a pitiful, neglected realm. His great theme was uh, the Constantine Compromise, the accommodation of Christianity to the values of the empire and the preservation of the status quo. Now again, he was an Episcopalian. What better church could better represent a sort of church of the status quo, certainly the church that he grew up in. Now, it's hard for us, who are kind of radical Episcopalians here, to remember that that was the Episcopal church that existed at one time. But it's not that hard to see it in some places. It still exists in some places. But 50, 60 years ago, the Episcopal church was the church of the status quo. It was the church of you know, Wall Street tycoons and, and presidents and all of that. Uh, and that's what he was rebelling against. In many ways, he was the prophet who foresaw that the Episcopal Church would eventually redeem itself to some extent. And I'm very happy for that. In one of his books, he wrote, my concern is to understand America biblically. Now that could be a very loaded statement Considering what we have just been through in our own country, where a lot of people have been trying, like people on another perspective, have been trying to do that same thing from a completely different perspective. 
There's a lot to that. And it can be, that can be a very dangerous statement, which Stringfellow would have embraced. And he would have said, yes, it, that is a very dangerous statement. And it should be. And that should be your challenge on that, is how Stringfellow would look at that. Uh, his friend, Anthony Down, died in 1980. Stringfellow mourned his passing, but he endured. Vocation, he wrote, has to do with recognizing life as a gift and honoring the gift in living. And so he honored uh, also the giver of life until his own death on March 2nd, 1985. At his funeral, Dan Berrigan said, for thousands of us, he became the honored keeper and guardian of the word of God. In the years that followed, others reflected on Stringfellow's life in the light of his own words. And this is Stringfellow. Being holy does not mean being perfect, but being whole. It does not mean being exceptionally religious or being religious at all. It means being liberated from religiosity and religious pietism of any sort. It does not mean being morally better. It means being exemplary. It does not mean being godly, but rather being truly human. He's a genius. I love Stringfellow. I, I go back to him. He's the guy, my go-to guy when things are going wrong for me in the church or in my own spirituality. I go to Stringfellow. He's my guy for that because somehow, sometimes I read him and he doesn't tell me what I want to hear. He tells me that sometimes the exact opposite of what I want to hear. He challenges me. And that's his true legacy, I think. He still is challenging so many people. My biggest regret about Stringfellow is more people don't know Stringfellow. He should be known. He is important. He wrote a lot of books. Um, one of my prized possessions is something Alice Howen gave me, a autographed book of William Stringfellow. I don't know how she got that, but I think she gave it to me. I don't know if she even knows it was autographed, but I did tell her later on. But I love that book. I love that book so much. Uh, it's not one of his better books, but I'm happy that it was you know one that he signed. Um, uh, Stringfellow and Town are actually buried on their uh, property on Block Island. Uh, the town, uh, the house is called the Escaton House, if, if you're ever on Block Island. Block Island, interesting little community there. Uh, their Episcopal Church had burned at one time, and um, they were going to rebuild the building. And Anthony Town and William Stringfellow uh, were having little house meetings of the 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 Episcopal community there on Block Island. And they had become so, uh, they, they'd become so uh, wonderful for them and so meaningful for them that when the building was built, they protested the building, the building itself and said, we don't want to go into the building. You, the building is the exact opposite of who we are now. And uh, that just gives you an idea of who they were. Well, sadly, both of the Requiem Masses were held in that building. Their ashes are buried on the property, and there's a little plaque there that says, near this spot, the remains of Anthony Town and William Stringfellow await the resurrection. I love that. I think that's very beautiful. Um, so uh, Stringfellow, wonderful guy. If you have not ever read anything of Stringfellow, please check him out. At least read some summaries of him. There's a lot of articles if you Google him. Um, you're not going to find much on YouTube. There wasn't a, many films or anything done, which is sad. I would think that one of the most fascinating movies that could be made is that whole Daniel Berrigan um, fugitive thing. I think that whole thing would have been a fascinating movie, but you maybe just maybe just for me. You could write the screenplay. Yes. I'm sure that would happen <laughs> in my free time. That I have. shall. <laughs> Thank you, though. I think... Maybe, maybe someday that'll happen. Uh, we're going to close tonight with a prayer for William Stringfellow, so let us pray. Almighty God, you gave to your servant William Stringfellow special gifts of grace to understand and teach the truth as it is in Christ Jesus. Grant that by this teaching we may know you, the one true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us not stand and profess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I 
believe in God, the Father, Father the Almighty, creator of heaven, heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us once more cast our cares upon God, saying, Hear our prayer. Hear, Hear our prayer. prayer. For your church, especially for this congregation of St. Stephen's, that the love and glory of God may be revealed in us, God of everlasting life. Hear, Hear our, our prayer. prayer. For this world so loved by you, that the power of your grace working in us might restore the beauty of its created image. God of everlasting life, hear our prayer. For those who glorify you in simple, hidden, and faith-filled ways, God of everlasting life, hear our prayer. For those labeled outsider, wrongdoer, and mischief maker, that they might be loved without judgment and might enjoy your gifts and grace, God of everlasting life, hear our, hear our prayer. prayer. For our homes, families, and friends, God of everlasting life, hear our prayer. prayer. For the leaders of the nations, may they exercise their office as servants of justice and peace, God of everlasting life, hear our prayer. prayer. For all who are suffering from illness, grief, loneliness, old age, and exile, may the resurrection be a source of comfort and aid for them, God of everlasting life. Hear our prayer. For those who have died, especially tonight we remember Michael Wold, Leon, Joyce and Al, and May. God of everlasting life. Hear our, our prayer. prayer. For whom we pray, either silently or aloud, I invite you now to share those. Hear our prayer. Hear our prayer. Living God, for whom no door is closed, no heart is locked, draw us beyond our doubts till we see your Christ and touch his wounds where they bleed in others. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. May the peace of the risen Christ be always with you. And also with you. Peace, peace, peace. Please be seated. Uh, just a few announcements before we continue with our service. Uh, of course, this week, we do have our rosary class tomorrow night, uh, our second class in the series. Uh, it was a lot of fun last week. We got a fair amount of people who joined us through live stream and a fair amount of people here in church as well. Last week, we did the, uh, the traditional Roman Catholic rosary, the Marian rosary. This week, we'll be doing the Anglican rosary. So that will be a lot of fun. It'll be kind of interesting. Uh, it's a very different prayer form than we've than the, the other kind of rosary, but we'll be learning a little bit about it next uh, tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. So join us. That will be live stream. Uh, there will be one more class after that next Thursday. And in that one, we'll be covering the Orthodox prayer rope, and we'll be covering other traditions as well, some of the, some of the other traditions that use prayer beads as part of their, their faith life. Uh, we do ask that uh, uh, if you haven't been keeping up on your offerings, please make sure you get your offerings in. We always need our offerings, especially as we're heading into this, this uh, well, we're getting closer and closer to summer, so that's always a good thing to be doing that as well. Uh, looking ahead down the road a little bit, we have a lot of stuff coming very quickly within the next couple of months. Uh, on May 19th, which is a Wednesday night, Bishop Tom Ely will be visiting us. We're very excited to have him on his uh, first visit here to St. Stephen's. It is going to be a very busy time for him. He's going to go from one thing to another. He's kind of like a rock star, just heading from his schedule is just very, very tight, but he will be visiting us and we will be having 
uh, confirmations and receptions. Uh, we will have a reception afterward, hopefully if the weather's nice, out in the parking lot. Uh, so that will be happening on May 19th. So please do come for that service and meet the, the new bishop, because he's a wonderful guy. We love him very, very much in this diocese. So um, uh, we're very excited to have him here. Uh, let's see, June 20th, heading ahead to, to June 20th, our own Deacon John will be celebrating his first anniversary as a deacon. And so because when he was ordained last June, we weren't able to really celebrate as we should have. So we're going to do it on the first anniversary. On that Sunday, John will be uh, renewing his ordination vows. We'll be renewing our baptismal vows because that is all tied in to it, of course. And uh, and we'll have a little reception for you, and we have some gifts for you, and some different things like that. Fabulous. Yes, so that will be a lot of fun. That will be on June twentieth. Okay. Any other announcements? I think things outside of that are pretty quiet. Uh, people have been asking about when we're going to be starting up with uh, like coffee hour and those kind of things. And as I keep saying, we don't know for certain yet. We're being very cautious. We will continue to be very cautious on this. But we have been hoping that maybe for Dedication Sunday in September, we're shooting that, using that as a goal. Nothing's written in stone. If things are not better by that point, we'll just keep off from doing that. But uh, we're hoping that maybe for, for September 12th, we'll be able to come back to some sort of normalcy. So keep praying for uh, the, the pandemic to continue to, to go away, that people will still get vaccines. If you have not had your vaccine, please go and get your vaccine. Um, most everybody here, I think, has pretty much had it, so uh, has had the vaccine. So we're very, very fortunate on that level. We knock wood on that one. And uh, we ask that, you know, if you haven't, just please do go and get it, because now is the time. You can get it. Everybody, I think, can get it now. So, um, so please do that. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself as an offering and sacrifice to God. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, through goodness we have this bread to offer, which the earth has given and human hands have made. Become for us the bread of life. Blessed be God forever. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, through goodness we have this wine to offer, the fruit of the vine and work of human hands. Become for us the cup of salvation. Blessed be God forever.
the Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is truly right and good and joyful to give you thanks, all holy God, source of life and fountain of mercy. Chiefly are we bound to praise you for the glorious resurrection of your Holy One, Jesus Christ, our Savior. For he is the true Paschal Lamb who was sacrificed for us and has taken away the sin of the world. By his death he has destroyed death, and by his rising to life again he has won for us everlasting life. Therefore, joining with the angels and archangels, and with the faithful of every generation, we lift our voices with all creation as we say, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he, only the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed are you, gracious God, creator of the universe and giver of life, recalling your great goodness to us in Jesus. We celebrate our redemption with this bread of life and this cup of salvation. Send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts of bread and wine, that they may be for us the body and blood of Jesus our Savior. On the night before he died for us, Jesus was at table with his friends. He took bread, gave thanks to you, broke it and gave it to them, and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup of wine. Again, he gave thanks to you, gave it to them and said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Grant that we who share these gifts may be filled with the Holy Spirit and live as Christ's body in the world. Bring us into the everlasting heritage of your daughters and sons, that with all your saints, past, present, and yet to come, we may praise your name forever. Through Christ, and with Christ, and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, to you be honor, glory, and praise forever and ever. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. But the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Amen. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia, alleluia. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. And at this time, let us pray for all those who cannot receive Holy Communion at this time. God of infinite mercy, we thank you for Jesus, our Savior, who feeds us and gives us eternal life. We pray for those who cannot be here at this time to consume these gifts of his body and blood in this bread and wine. But we pray that they may receive the sacrament of Christ's presence, the forgiveness of sins, and all other benefits of Christ's passion. Grant that we may continue forever in the risen life of our Savior, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen.
Let us pray. <clears throat> Loving God, we give you thanks for restoring us in your image and nourishing us with spiritual food in the sacrament of Christ's body and blood. Now send us forth a people forgiven, healed, renewed, that we may proclaim your love to the world and continue in the risen life of Christ our Savior. Amen. May the God of peace who brought again from the dead, our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, make you perfect in every good work to do God's will. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you now and always. Amen. <clears throat> Now let us go forth in the name of the risen Christ. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. alleluia.